Good evening. How is everyone tonight? All right. Isn't that video awesome? So one of our many talented staff members, Dennis Shute, did that for us. Uh, just love that. My name is Greg Gorga, Executive Director of your Santa Barbara Maritime Museum. I want to welcome you tonight to Central Coast Ocean Adventures and the Tall Ship Mystic Talk with Christine Healy and Michael Sheehy. Uh, you're, uh, and, uh, hopefully you've seen the Tall Ship at the end of Marina One there. Uh, I want to thank our lecture series sponsor, Maria L. Morris Rowe. Uh, she's been a great fan of our lecture series for many years uh, and we greatly appreciate her sponsorship. Uh, did you enjoy it? Yeah, let's hear it for Marie. Yeah. Everybody get to taste some wine and uh, some cheese. So that's uh, Sevtap, uh, Art with Sevtap pouring some wine here. We also want, yes, let's hear it for Art. We also want to thank Giordano's and One Vine Wines for their sponsorship. And yes, let's. All right, A lively crowd, I love that. Uh, this is being recorded. It will be up on TV Santa Barbara. It usually takes us a week or two to get it up there. So. Um, if you're not supposed to be here tonight, don't look be behind you. Uh, but do tell your friends when that comes out. Uh, everybody get upstairs to see the peaceful sea. Yeah. Isn't that beautiful? So Kevin Short, amazing artist. That exhibit is on display here through December. Um, and um, we're very happy to have Kevin here. And um, for those I know, many of you are Yacht Club members. He is doing the Monday lunch forum uh, this coming Monday at the Yacht Club. Um, and so uh, it has been a extremely busy October for us here at the Santa Barbara Maritime Museum. Uh, besides Harbor and Seafood Festival, uh, we had uh, on the 1st and 2nd of October, we did Girls in Ocean Science, which is a program we piloted last year during the waning days of COVID and got a much bigger response this year. Uh, we had one day of junior high school and one day of high school young ladies, uh, and the whole point was to inspire them to pursue the marine sciences or some type of ocean-related career in college. And so we had about 50 young ladies come through that program, thanks to the Steinmetz Foundation for that. We, had, uh, st we have started, you'll probably hear more about it tonight, our, uh, our uh, programming with the Mystic Whaler. Uh, for, so I think we've had 10, we will have had 10 piloted classes between October 10th and the 25th aboard the Mystic Whaler, and very excited to do that. Uh, tonight marks this uh, opening again of science nights, which have not happened for a few years because of COVID. So some of our staff are out uh, doing a science night with uh, one of the local schools. Um, we're very excited to have Kevin Short here on Sunday from 1 to 4 doing an art class, which he doesn't normally do. There are a few spaces available. It's $150, and you'll have some wine and, and cheese and get a, a lesson with Kevin Short. So if you're interested in that, it is on our website. Uh, our last lecture of the calendar year, we, we are dark in December, but on November 17th, we'll have uh, Shumash Maritime History by Shumash Elder Alan Salazar, and Alan has done some great talks with us before here, uh, and really our maritime history here in the Santa Barbara Channel began with the Shumash, so very looking forward to that. Uh, and then in January, we start our annual 10-week docent training program, so if you're interested in becoming a docent and learning so much about our local maritime history, uh, that's, uh, I think, 10 uh, Wednesday mornings. You can sign up for that on our website, sbmn.org. And then we also uh, only have about a week and a half left before these tickets go out to the general public. Uh, uh, we have some seats left uh, for late February for a trip to the San Ignacio Lagoon. Uh, we had about 30 members last year where we interact with gray whales. That's where they're birthing and nursing their, their pups. Uh, we had 30 members last year. We had everybody on, on that trip touch the gray whale. Uh, I kissed either the same whale three times. I might be engaged. <laughs> or three different whales, I, which, you know, otherwise. Uh, but it's an amazing experience. You're on uh, ponga boats uh, owned by the local fishermen, so you're hearing about their fishing experience down there, but you're, you're, these whales come right up to the ponga boats. It's really incredible. So uh, do come uh, get on our website to see or call Martha or I about that. Uh, again, uh, those tickets uh, are only reserved for Maritime Museum members for another seven to ten days. And uh, hopefully you're following us on Instagram, Facebook, get our email newsletters. Uh, it's very easy to do. Bottom of our homepage is just your name and email address. 
Uh, I want to thank all of you who are members of the Santa Barbara Maritime Museum, and especially big thank you for those of you who are members of our Navigator Circle, our $1,000 and up uh, annual donors, and then those of you who have left, uh, mentioned the Maritime Museum and left uh, something in your uh, estate planning, our, your flag uh, our flagship society members. So easy to do a, 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 a state gift through your IRA, your insurance, uh, um, many different options. So uh, if you're interested in remembering the Maritime Museum in your estate planning, please come see Martha or I as well. Um, and that really ensures the long-term sustainability of the Maritime Museum and all of your support, whether it's membership, NAV, circle, or flagship, uh, allows us to do the amazing exhibits and uh, education programming that you're gonna hear about tonight. So uh, we have two uh, speakers tonight, so a, a longer bio. A bio so. Uh, we are pleased tonight to be joined by Michael Sheehy and Christine Healy from Central Coast Ocean Adventures, CCOA. Uh, they are committed to enriching STEM academic comprehension, environmental stewardship, ship and sail training, and social emotional learning on board its 110 ship Mystic Whaler, where adventure inspired learning is explored through sailing and the sea. Their mission is to provide experiential teaching and nautical skills, teamwork, leadership, and environmental responsibility on the Central Coast and Channel Islands. And I should also mention, uh, I'm sure they will, but uh, this ship was brought to Santa Barbara, brought to the West Coast by Roger and Sarah Chrisman. Uh, yeah, let's hear it for Roger and Sarah Chrisman. Uh, uh, Roger and Sarah have been long-term, uh, long-time supporters of the Maritime Museum. He's been a um, board member. Uh, actually, I'm here because of Roger Christman. I actually sent my resume to Sarah, and he picked it up and, and had me apply for this job here. So, uh, so they had one mark against them. But other than that, they've been great. Um, but uh, but uh, and you know, I like to kid, but this is serious because they have always supported our education programs, our tallship programs. Uh, they believe no child should be left ashore. So. Uh, uh, <laughs> All right, so about our speakers. Michael Sheehy is the Director of Development and Programming for CCOA and holds a Master's Degree in Marine Ecology and Evolutionary Biology from UCSB, an MBA from Pepperdine University, and a Certificate in Social Entrepreneurship from Stanford University's Graduate School of Business. What a slacker, huh? Oh my God. Uh, Michael has studied the ocean and its wildlife as a work, working scuba diver for NOAA and as a research associate associate at the Marine Science Institute, MSI at UCSB. He has also lectured at UCSB in marine biology and taught marine science for Northeastern University's Three Seas program in Jamaica and aboard the tall ship Westward for Sea Education Association. Michael has led marine science research in the Caribbean for UCSB and marine conservation advocacy as director of marine programs for Santa Barbara Channel Keeper. He has supported marine conservation as executive director of the Code Blue Foundation and served as director of development for the Los Angeles Maritime Institute and the Children's Maritime Institute, working aboard the tall ships Irving Johnson, Exe Johnson, and American Pride. Christine Healy is the captain of CCOA's Mystic Whaler and director of CCOA. She learned to sail and race growing up around Chesapeake Bay. At the age of 19, she bought her first boat. And while living aboard, she was offered her first longboat delivery from Annapolis to St. Vincent via Bermuda. After several deliveries, she began her first job aboard the schooners Woodwind and Woodwind II, which was the beginning of her traditional boat career. With that experience, she moved on to larger ships, Pride of Baltimore II, Amistad, Clipper City, Liberty, and many others. And at the age of just 23, she set for her first captain's license, 100-ton master with sail endorsement. In 2008, she moved to California and worked on the Lynx, which sailed up and down the West Coast, then out to Hawaii as an exhibition class in the Transpac 2009, and she has been working on the West Coast based out of San Diego uh, since, but lives here in Santa Barbara now. So please join me in welcoming Michael and Christine. <laughs> Just so thrilled. Uh both I am and Captain Christine Healy to be here tonight uh, to share the stories of CCOA and the Mystic Whaler and its, uh, its um, arrival to California. Um, I wanted to start off um, really just thanking Greg and uh, the Santa Barbara Maritime Museum. We've uh, been running this wonderful partnership uh, program here for the last month. Um, in telling the story of trading here in what is now California, the maritime trade. 
And um, it's just been beautiful to see. We've been having fourth graders on board from schools uh, around the area. And um, it's just been a great partnership. So thank you, Greg. Um, but tonight, we're going to tell a different story, uh, um, some maritime stories that um, have to do more with, uh, <clears throat> I would say, the, the classic themes of love and adventure. Um, and Greg touched on this, and, I, and, and it's really fitting to start with this. But uh, you know, at the basis of all of that um, is our, you know, our beautiful, uh, caring, and generous uh, Roger and Sarah Chrisman, um, residents of Santa Barbara, and, and their love for the Santa Barbara Channel, and their vision to make that channel more accessible, and, and the learning opportunities that come with it to the communities of Santa Barbara and Ventura counties. So, you know, we're eternally grateful to Roger and Sarah Chrisman. And they really, um, from that love story of their uh, love of the channel, was born Central Coast Ocean Adventures and uh, its tall ship, Mystic Whaler. Um, on that note, I'm going to hand it back over to Captain Christine Healy, uh, who will talk about the, the adventure and love having to do with bringing uh, Mystic Whaler to our shore. Oh, just there. Okay. Hi, good evening, everybody. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not used to lights in my face. Welcome. Um, I'm Christine Healy. I am the Captain Mystic Whaler. <laughs> So a little bit about this ship. Uh, Mystic Whaler is 110 feet sparred length. She's 85 in the hull. Uh, she was built by George Sutton in 1967. We have a 27 foot beam. Uh, we are a centerboard. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure if anyone uh, sails here. I can't really see anybody. <laughs> but um, <laughs> centerboard means our keel can go up and down. And uh, so we can go from an eight and a half foot draft all the way to a 14 foot draft. We have a single Detroit 671 on board. That is the only engine that powers the ship and we can carry up to 50 passengers for day sails. Our overnight capacity is 34. Mystic Whaler on the East Coast, uh, she, from the time she was built in 1967 up until 2000, and 21, basically last October when I was brought into the project, she operated mainly out of Mystic and New London, Connecticut. She would every year head down to New York for the Clearwater program on the Hudson River. And then I personally have known this boat since I was 19 um, as a teenager in Annapolis because on board the Woodwinds, I would race against it in the Great Chesapeake Bay Schooner Race. <laughs> which is an amazing, amazing race. It goes from Baltimore to Norfolk every year. It actually just happened uh, about a week ago, and uh, I was tra tracking the race. So, and uh, it's really, really a very special boat to me. For 30 years, she was owned and operated by Captain John Edgington, his wife, Pat Edgington. Uh, the boat was also their home. They loved it. She, you can tell this boat has been well-maintained and well-loved. For, the, uh, for her whole life, which is um, really quite unique for tall ships. In our last October, uh, I had someone ask for my resume, and um, I passed it along, and before I knew it, uh, I was very fortunate that Roger Chrisman called me, and he said, we are buying a tall ship, and I said, what tall ship is it? And he said, the Mystic Whaler, um, and I was very, very excited. Um, interviewed with him, and then that's how my adventure with Mystic Whaler and CCOA started. I was with a, someone asking for my resume and a phone call. I was so excited at the prospect, um, not only to bring another ship to the West Coast, which has a, a lack of ships at the moment, a lot of them have moved to the Caribbean or back to the East Coast, and to bring one specifically to this section of the coast, there aren't really any in this section. My first task was to find the crew. <laughs> uh, tall ships take quite a lot of people to sail, um, and I was, uh, we had to move the boat before the winter. Um, and being brought in in October, your time for making transits down the East Coast is late October, November. Once you get into December, the weather is just, oh, sorry. Once you get into December, the weather is just too rough to make these transits. Captain Edgington I contacted, um, who I knew very well. Uh, on my time on Amistad, we were at Mystic Seaport, and I did a full downrig and uprig with that ship, and we were docked right next to each other. So when I spoke to Captain Edgington, he said, don't worry, I'll help you put together a crew. 
And then we had some crew from the West Coast join us. Then I had to plan the voyage. Uh, it was a very short, I did a, a quick uh, voyage plan, had that sent out. Um, if anyone ever does longer transits, you know you always leave a voyage plan with somebody and you need to plan yourself. I flew out to the boat and on October 20th, we left Mystic Seaport. It was such an incredibly gorgeous morning. The day we left, it was just glass, beautiful fall day. Um, in Connecticut, and this is one of the photos I snapped as we were heading down the Mystic River. These are the two, uh, this is down the Mystic River and then one of the coolest swing bridges um, that I, I used to transit a lot. I once brought Amistad through this bridge in a blizzard, which I don't recommend ever doing. <laughs> uh, it's a very shallow channel. You have to be dead center in the channel as you navigate in and out of that river. And you also have to wait for your tides. From there, we continued on. Our weather, uh, our weather wasn't great. We actually pulled into New London for a day. And then we continued on through New York. Uh, this is us coming through New York City. We ended up, due to the weather, coming down Long Island Sound, coming in through the East River, going through Hellgate, and then going out New York Harbor. It had been some time since I had been through New York Harbor, um, and this was a very happy time to be going through. Of course, New York. I was originally born in New York before moving to Annapolis, so I have a, an affinity for it. <laughs> Once we left there, we got through New York Harbor. We anchored off Sandy Hook, New Jersey for the night, and then we headed back out to sea. It was really, really calm. We did a lot of motoring. Um, not as much sailing as I was hoping, but you know what? I'll take this over the, the rough Atlantic conditions. We continued on. It took, a while. it took us about 14 days to get down the coast. Uh, the ship that we were waiting for, the Cerulean, which was the large tanker, we were, took the boat from Mystic, Connecticut down to Fort Lauderdale. And on uh, November 29th, we had actually had arrived in Fort Lauderdale on November 13th, and I waited for three weeks for the ship. Um, it was a long wait period. We didn't know when it was coming. Uh, it, was, uh, it was during the time where they had all of um, the cargo issues with car tankers sitting outside of harbors and um, the supply chain issue. Um, so getting this ship in and then waiting for it. But finally, on November 29th, uh, myself and only two other crew members uh, who are actually here from Santa Barbara um, brought the boat over to the tanker and were able to drop her off and finally come home. <laughs> Um, as big as Mystic Whaler seems, <laughs> um, the, the yacht transport was massive. Not only does this ship do yacht transport, it also does general cargo. And pulling up next to it and feeling like a tender was very, uh, <laughs> very intimidating. This is the boat being loaded onto the ship. Uh, that one of those giant cranes just came down, picked it up in the slings. Uh, they got her just, just up in the slings. They offloaded us into a tender, whisked us away. They picked her up and then they put her right down onto the deck of the tanker. The boat was on the, the ship was on the, well, the boat was on the ship. <laughs> uh, for a few weeks, we were waiting for it. I was tracking it. The days kept shifting a little bit. I knew it was going to come in sometime around Christmas time into Ensenada. And then so my work began immediately as soon as I got to this coast. A lot of the, co the crew that helped us bring it down the East Coast were from the East Coast and were going to remain there. I did have a few remaining crew members that would travel to the West Coast with us, but I had to work to get enough crew to bring her home from Ensenada. So heading north, <laughs> we were able to assemble a crew. I went down to meet the ship on December 22nd, um, and they were like, oh, it'll be launched on the 25th, and I was like, it's Christmas in Mexico, not much happens. And so I figured, I know we're leaving the 26th, and so we did. <laughs> and we prepared the ship, the crew came in the day after Christmas, we prepared the ship for one day, had one night there, and then actually on the 27th, we departed. Um, as we were heading north, uh, I don't know if you remember last winter, but there was so much weather going through. And we finally had enough of a weather window. I had about an 18 hour window to be able to make it to at least San Diego. So we took that window and we left. On that transit, we had some exciting moments. Um, we had a, a few complications. And for those that sail, uh, we parted our main sheet in the middle of the night 
And for those at sale, you can know how serious that situation could be. Thankfully, from, I had cell phone reception. I was able to call San Diego Maritime Museum, and they said that we could bring her in so that we could make the repairs that we needed to and also hide from the weather that was uh, rapidly approaching us from the north. We sat in San Diego for about a week, which was really quite lovely. I was able to actually uh, to spend New Year's with my family. After New Year's, we, were, we brought the boat up to its new home, which is Channel Islands Harbor. And it was, uh, it, was a huge under, it was a huge relief and also excitement uh, to bring the ship home. It was January 9th when we came in, and it was a beautiful, beautiful morning. And I was just so excited to have completed this amazingly, amazing journey. But at the end of that journey is where the really hard work began. <laughs> um, the boat is an inspected vessel, so that means we carry a certificate of inspection. The boat was in what was called layup status, and layup status means you can't carry passengers. Although you haven't lost your COI, it's just inactive, and you have to regain that. It would have been one thing if we were re, you know, putting it re back into a working status in Connecticut, but because we were in an all new ocean, under new inspectors, um, a new organization operating it, it ended up being quite a lot of work to be able to regain our COI. Um, so it took a few months for things to go through. Finally, we were able to uh, get our COI after a couple of months. But having a COI, uh, which is what allows you to operate and, see, and carry passengers, it says the Coast Guard dictates how many people you can carry and what waters you can operate in. But having the, this is only half of it. The other half is a hull inspection. And this was our crew for while we had on board for conducting our COI, which I'm very, very proud of our crew. And since the COI, we've been doing a lot of crew training, um, working hard. Some of our crew are new to tall ships. They come from the you know, smaller boat. Um, they're very young. They were uh, instructors for uh, some of the yacht club teams down in Channel Islands. They want to get into traditional boats and education. So working with them to teach them, although they're great sailors, they don't, sailing a tall ship is very different from doing modern boat racing and especially smaller, uh, smaller boat racing. So we've spent a lot of time doing maintenance and crew training. I decided to haul the boat in August um, so that we could be here for this fall. And so what we did was I brought, once again, brought on a bunch of crew. <laughs> and we took the boat down to San Diego. There's very few um, travel lifts that can actually pick this boat up. And due to the fact that we're a centerboard, I need to have a very large travel lift that can pick us up high enough to be able to drop the centerboard. There's only one lift pretty much um, south of Point Conception and that exists at Marine Group in San Diego. So back to San Diego, we transited for our haul out. Um, it is tight, I don't know if anyone's ever been into Marine Group but, or and a, any shipyard, but it can always be a little bit tight to get into a shipyard. And here's a quick little time lapse of what it looks like to back a 110 foot schooner into a haul out slip. <laughs> it was also a little bit windy, it doesn't look it, but we were supposed to haul at 8 a.m. where there's no wind, which would have been perfect. Um, but there was a bit of a delay and so we ended up hauling it about like 12, 12.30 in the afternoon. So, and um, <laughs> We finally made it. <laughs> it is very tight maneuvering in there. <laughs> this is her once when she's all blocked up. And kind of you can see that underbody a little bit more. This is after we had our new bottom paint. A lot of projects were done in shipyard. This is us launching her after shipyard. After we did all of the work, had our hull inspection, which I was very thankful Coast Guard passed us right away uh, with flying colors, and that's due to the care and love that previous crews had done and taking care of her, which we were maintaining. And then we got underway. Um, I don't know, it's a little hard to see. Uh, my pug travels with us, Emma, so safety is always priority number one for all of our crew. Not only do we wear our PFDs uh, offshore, but Emma has her nightlights and her PFD. <laughs> 
If anyone's ever curious what it looks like from aloft, so many people say, oh, I want to climb up on a tall ship. Well, this is from uh, the platform that is on our main mast. So we have a shot looking forward and then a shot looking after. We couldn't quite get the whole boat uh, from a cell phone photo. But this is what she looks like from aloft. This is actually back in Channel Islands Harbor. Uh, we've been continuing on after our hull inspection. There's a few more things that we do have to finish up. And so maintenance and crew training uh, are still continuous. They're never ending on a tall ship. And the crew. The crew is what is really quite amazing. The, so many people have sailed on this ship on the East Coast and now also on the West Coast. And I, I am so looking forward to how many more will sail with us. Um, every port I've been to with this ship, people will come up and whether they were crew on board the ship or a student on board the ship or just even a guest on the ship, she leaves a lasting impression, and I hope to be able to continue on and fulfill creating memories for people. And of course, more of our crew. <laughs> I'm gonna pass it now to Michael. It's such a great picture. Um, I, and <clears throat> I'm gonna bring it back now. So um, we've got that wonderful experience with Mystic Whaler and the voyage here to California and, and really the love that had to um, sort of carry it through, right? Um, as you saw, it takes a lot of people to, to crew a, a tall ship. Um, and and it's, it's no surprise and it's not a coincidence that tall ships were seen by Roger and Sarah Christman um, as a great platform to actually introduce the channel to uh, young people and to families uh, here in, in our communities. Um, as you can imagine, they, they evoke wonder and mystery, and they also require teamwork. Um, it, it, it takes you know, five students to 10 students to, to raise the main, um, and, and every, every aspect of a tall ship requires teamwork and leadership. Um, and all of these components go so well into um, making Mystic Whaler kind of one of the heroes in this love story. Um, <clears throat> and another, another hero uh, that's each, equally significant is the sea, right? Um, it also carries so much of the same characteristics as a tall ship. Um, it's, it's power, it's challenge, um, it, it, it humbles us, um, and, and it, it does, you know, uh, we all have different relationships to the sea, I should say, and, um, and with that comes um, sometimes uh, us facing adversity and, and showing some resilience, right? And, and these are components of what, what uh, the Christmans really saw as a perfect mixture of, of um, elevating children's um, uh, empowerment of themselves to, to, uh, to raise up and, and experience um, a deeper understanding and a deeper learning of um, any kind of uh, education that they're getting on board. Um, and, and this is not new necessarily, right? Um, there's experiential education um, there's, there's ex experiential learning. We know it as different names, different forms, kinetic learning, hands-on learning, um, all these aspects um, that have a growing proof in the education fields of, of really um, um, deepening a, a student's um, understanding of a subject matter and, um, and increasing retention of that subject matter. So, so obviously, as you experience something, you are learning through that experience, and if you put intention behind that, let's say a goal of, a, of learning a subject, um, having them do an activity to, to better understand and comprehend the materials that, that they're required um, only grows deeper in their knowledge uh, and stays with them longer. And furthermore, you know, add on to that, um, nature and outdoor experiential education. So combining 
<clears throat> those experiences and those learnings uh, with the humbleness of doing it out in nature, the connections that are made, um, and sometimes the adversity that exists um, has been well proven to, uh, to be um, uh, profoundly powerful in, in uh, personal development and uh, lasting learning. And here are some, um, some aspects to, to student growth that occur through uh, outdoor education. <clears throat> and, and so this is the perfect mixture, right? We have, we have intentional adventure-inspired learning uh, that's going to be explored through sailing and the sea. So, you know, students will be on board uh, actually sailing the ship, navigating the ship, learning lessons in marine science, discovering things about um, the Santa Barbara Channel and about themselves. It's, it's kind of this great trifecta, right, where we have um, the, the inspired learning, so, so this is uh, very intentional, um, with the mediums of the Mystic Whaler and the Santa Barbara Channel, and of course, the participant, the, the, those that are willing to take that journey, take that adventure, um, leading to, you know, no matter what the subject matter, it's going to be a deeper understanding of, of it and of the world around them. And, um, and, and so in some ways, uh, kind of see CCOA, or as the Maritime Museum affectionately calls us, um, Kakoa, <laughs> which, which might stick, um, we, we kind of see ourselves as matchmakers uh, between uh, those students, those that are participating, and, and the mediums of the channel and Mystic Whaler, really. So, so we bring intentional uh, um, education and, and awareness to the experiences that they're having. Um, and we're really excited to do this in a number of different fields. So um, you can imagine with, um, with all these students working together that um, on certain projects, uh, certain themes, we have the opportunity to cover all sorts of STEM academic comprehension um, uh, themes, uh, uh, hopefully promoting uh, environmental stewardship through our um, um, uh, marine sciences programs and, and truly there connecting with the nature and the environment of the Channel Islands. Um, it's a great opportunity to work on social emotional uh, learning. Um, this, is, this is an aspect where you know, you, you, you can feel claustrophobic, right, on a tall ship, even on a 110-foot tall ship. Um, the, the opportunity to have students working together, understanding each other, understanding emotions, and communicating. Communication on a tall ship is, is, is paramount. Um, and of course, nautical skills, and as we're, we're doing uh, this month, uh, history, and, and really um, passing on lessons from the past to students and how they can navigate the, the, the present and the future with those lessons. Um, and, and something that's incredibly important to us is volunteering and volunteer opportunities. Uh, and so we're developing a youth crew program, um, an adult uh, crew program, where people really can participate, and this is, uh, you know, as, as a, a means of serving the community, always uh, offering that opportunity to participate um, and, and help us from anything from maintenance to crewing and sailing to administration. Um, we're really open to any help we can get, but also see it as, as um, our responsibility to have a place for all of, all of us. Um, and as I said, you know, so, so with that matchmaking, uh, you know, you, you want to be pretty good at it. <laughs> and um, we're very excited and very fortunate to have uh, a wonderful crew and, and, you know, in the tall ship education world, uh, there are educators and, and crew members. Um, you know, everyone is, is in, 
responsible for the workings of the ship, but also responsible for the care and well-being and, and learning of the children. Um, and as you can see, uh, we have an, uh, expertise in a number of different relevant fields and, um, and importantly have been trained in, in areas that will be very significant in, in branching into any of those intentional areas that we have. Uh, emotional regulation training um, where we can work with kids who may feel overwhelmed uh, being in an unfamiliar environment or uh, being challenged in a way. Um, and, and, and then, of course, academic uh, common core education uh, models and, and principles. Um, CCOA uh, is, is approaching um, youth education and community education uh, very thoughtfully and responsibly. And, um, and it is a commitment that um, Sarah and Roger Chrisman have made and a commitment that the nonprofit stands for uh, that, uh, that will make the resources of the Santa Barbara Channel um, accessible to all. And with that, um, you know, we, we intend to break barriers uh, to educational opportunities like, like uh, experiential education on tall ships. Um, and, and, you know, there are some uh, obvious barriers of uh, economics, um, you know, financial means of schools or, or families. Uh, and, and as a nonprofit, we will uh, subsidize and support, um, you know, uh, partial subsidy to full, full no cost uh, opportunities for those who may not otherwise have the opportunity. We also really hope to work with uh, communities in Santa Barbara and Ventura County that are inland um, to give them an opportunity to come to the coast and see the resources that are here um, and experience that from an educational standpoint. And then cultural, there's so many cultural barriers that exist in enjoying and learning from the channel. Um, I, I know uh, personally that I've, I've seen um, often a, a low enrollment in programs um, and, and getting to the heart of that, it, it sometimes is a result of uh, a, a parental fear and anxiousness of the sea, not so much the child. So, so we, um, we really intend to offer programs that will include family members, will include parents and intergenerational programs um, to, to alleviate some of those apprehensions and really allow all members of a family unit to, to learn how you can be challenged but safe in the environment of a tall ship and the sea. And then um, we, we very much are community uh, directed and driven. Um, it's important to us to, to remain relevant to the community needs uh, in that way um, we, we are really looking to the community for input on the types of programs that are needed uh, for different groups. Uh, we have a survey online on our website that uh, you're all invited to take. Um, we, we are uh, soliciting it out to uh, uh, schools, community-based organizations, um, anyone who signs up to our newsletter. Uh, anyone um, can take this survey and it's really an invite to, to ask, you know, with the constituents you feel you identify with, you know, what type of program can you see uh, would most benefit you given the, the opportunity to have uh, tall ship programs uh, and, and access the coast and ocean. And in, in a way, this, this sort of love story that, um, you know, I tried to sort of convey it, it's, to me, it is one because, um, because you know, when, when you adventure into something, it's unfamiliar, it's, uh, it's, it's you know, scary, um, but there's benefits. And, um, and, and, and while that relationship may change, um, as you get familiar with something, you begin to uh, appreciate it more. And the understanding here is, you know, the, the, more, the more we raise um, knowledge of our youth, of our communities, 
to the benefits um, and, and the sensitivities of our environment, our channel, and of ourselves, um, you know, the, the more that appreciation can turn to empathy um, and that empathy can turn to love. So, um, you know, the, what we hope to be achieving here is uh, certainly strengthening the understanding and connection we all have to nature, to our, to others, and and certainly you know love ourselves more. So that's really what we're hoping students can walk away from our programs um, a little bit, uh, um, you know, more grown up, more mature in in those areas. <clears throat> And, and I, I mentioned students, and I'm, I'm still trying to work out how we want to talk about this, because uh, CCOA and Mystic Whaler are actually um, uh, are resources for all, um, mm -hmm. not just for, for young people. While we, while we uh, focus many of our programs for the ages of uh, 10 to 18, we certainly want to offer uh, programs for uh, all ages. And, and there are opportunities in many ways that, um, that uh, everyone can get involved. Um, and we do want to mention, you know, the Mystic Whaler uh, can provide um, opportunities for your businesses with team building. Um, we, we are very excited to be offering uh, naturalist sales, uh, you know, day sales and overnights. Um, and certainly a, a great resource for fundraisers and, um, and a, a very important outreach opportunity for us is to have public sales. So, so if you go on our website, you can sign up uh, with our, um, just a, it's at the top of the page on our website. Um, there's a join our mailing list and you'll be informed of, of these opportunities as they come forward. With that, um, this is a picture of the uh, I believe it was maybe two days ago, the, the students that came on board. Um, this is the end of the, the, their voyage uh, for the day. Um, and uh, lots of happy faces. And uh, I really want to thank the Santa Barbara Maritime Museum and all of you so much. Appreciate it. I think there's time for questions. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, so the question was, uh, what was the inspiration uh, for the Chrismans uh, in, um, and I'll, I'll correct it, they didn't build uh, Mystic Whaler. Uh, Mystic Whaler was built in 1967 uh, in Fort Lauderdale. Yeah, they purchased her in 2001. Yeah. Um, I mean, honestly, this is a question for Roger and Sarah, but, um, but I, I'll try to answer it and hopefully they'll be okay with that. <laughs> um, but mostly it was their, the spirit of Dana Point would come um, and work with Santa Barbara Maritime Museum. And uh, Spirit of Dame Point had to go into a refit, and then the, the ship wasn't traveling. And um, when I spoke earlier about the void of tall ships and educational programming on tall ships on the West Coast, is because so many of them had left. And this section of the coast has never had its own ship. And so what they, they wanted to do was to bring another ship out so that this entire area, Santa Barbara, Ventura County, could be serviced and um, have one of these amazing vessels. So that was a little bit of their catalyst, to be able to get kids back on the water, back onto a traditional vessel, um, just because Honestly, there aren't really very many on this coast. There's about four that I can think of that are still here and operating now. And, um, and, we, and they wanted to bring something here so that kids could continue to have that opportunity. Uh, mm -hmm. Because when um, Spirit of Dame Point had to go into a refit, there wasn't another option um, to be able to still continue getting children out. And so. So what he wants to know is, um, how do they, how, what the exact number for sailing a tall, the a Mystic Whaler is, and then how does the Coast Guard calculate the amount of people it takes um, to safely operate a ship on your COI? Um, well, for technically, according to the Coast Guard, for our minimum for a day sail is five professional crew. Um, personally, that is 
It, it works, but it's very short. I prefer to have six to seven crew. Our, our sales are incredibly, incredibly heavy. Um, and then generally, so when the Coast Guard's doing your inspection for the second part of the question, um, anything under 12 hours is five, and then anything over 12 hours is 10. They generally double it. Um, and what they do is they look at the size of the vessel. Part of your inspection is that you get off the dock physically with the Coast Guard and you run through all of your safety drills, your man overboard drills, your abandoned ship drill, your, um, your fire drill, any of those. And they kind of look at the operation, the size of the vessel, how many people, and that's what determines the number. Thank you. You're welcome. So this is a question um, to explain the sail plan a little bit that we have. We are a bald-headed uh, uh, gaff rig schooner. So we fly what we call the four lowers. Um, we have a jib, a staysail, a foresail, and a mainsail. Do we have a picture of the ship? Find one. She sails pretty well. This is your mainsail. Generally, with a, the more mast you have, your sails are named for what, um, for what mast they're flying off of. As far as schooners go, this is a very, um, this is a fairly simple rig. A lot of people are somewhat intimidated, especially if you're used to sailing like a Marconi rig saloon, which is what most modern boats are. Um, so you'll have a mainsail, maybe a staysail, maybe a jib, or if you, depending on if you're cutter rig or not, or you might just have a mainsail and a jib. Um, so this is the main, it's flown off the main mast. The boat did have a topmast, which would be an extension above the main mast, except for we, it's, we don't fly anything off it, and it's a lot of weight aloft. <laughs> so which, if you have more weight aloft, your roll gets further. <laughs> so we actually uh, took it down um, for this coast. This is the foresail flown off the foremast. We have a club staysail, that's our staysail, and then our jet. And so it's a bald-headed gap break schooner. She sails pretty well because she's a centerboard. Even with the board all the way down, we can make a lot of leeway. If anyone's a sailor, maybe she slides sideways quite a bit. Um, but aside from that, she'll sail really well. She'll come through stays, which is uh, when you tack. Um, you know, sometimes in lighter winds, a boat will be caught in irons where you just get stuck and winds kind of bottom there for a while. It's a little embarrassing. <laughs> um, however, this boat actually will come through stays very nicely. You back your head soles and then I'll give the command to pass head soles and then she'll carry right on over. So she sails really, really well. Um, coming up from San Diego, we were doing about nine and a half knots. And when we brought her down for shipyard, we had the most amazing sailing day. Um, it was, I had a single reef set in the main, uh, four and then our head soles, and we were just, we sailed pretty much from Channel Islands Harbor and then all the way down to Avalon. I cut across to the north side of Catalina and we grew up, like sailed just along uh, Catalina because it's really nice to go out to Catalina and sail that way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and then we jumped the channel again to head back over to San Diego. And um, by, by then it was nightfall and the wind had died, but we had just a, an amazing, amazing sail on the way down. Uh, the question was how old is the boat point? And Oh, oh, and then the second question is, um, what kind of engine? Um, the first, to answer your first question, it does not point well at all. Um, <laughs> uh, pretty much, uh, schooners, gaff rig schooners don't point all that well, and she's very, very flat bottom. Um, so yeah, we don't we don't point very well at all. Um, but it's okay. We really, really fly at a beam reach, <laughs> and after that. Um, and then our, our engine is a uh, Detroit 671, so. So the, the question is, um, uh, where does Mystic Whaler reside, uh, typically? Uh, she is here in Santa Barbara until the 26th of October to finish off the, uh, the education program, the living history program uh, in partnership with the museum. Um, and then we'll return back to Channel Islands Harbor, which is the home port for Mystic Whaler. Uh, there in Oxnard. And then when you come back? Yeah, yeah, so, so uh, we'll, the, the plan is to service um, both Ventura counties and Santa Barbara County. So, so the vision is uh, to, to come back and forth between Oxnard and Santa Barbara, um, depending on uh, you know, what school groups or, or community-based organizations we're serving. So this will be the home? Uh, the, Yes, this, the, yes, 
the California coast, uh, and, and you will always be able to find us uh, online, but we'll most often be in Channel Islands Harbor. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Um, so uh, the question is um, that I grew up sailing, and um, if my parents, uh, yes, my parents are still, uh, still around, and um, I think they're pretty proud. Um, when I first started this career, um, they were not the most thrilled. <laughs> I think they were very, very uncertain. Um, they were like, okay, we know, you know, we know you love it and everything. Um, I, ha I was uh, going to school for fine arts. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and then one day I just, um, some things happened and I, I was like, I wanna go sailing. And so, um, and that's when, when I called them to let them know I had picked up my, my very first delivery, um, and, you know, which was Annapolis uh, to St. Vincent via Bermuda on this small, it was, a, it was a 40 foot catamaran actually, a Fontaine Peugeot, and that's a long way to go. And it was, um, they, they were like, well, how can we get into, <laughs> like, how are we gonna find you? It was before AIS. And um, I was like, don't worry, mom, that'll be okay. And they, my mom said she was never so worried as until I called from Bermuda. <laughs> and, um, but as my career has progressed and they've come to see more of the ships that I've worked on, um, it's been pretty, they're, they're, they're very proud, so. <laughs> So the question is, what is the red brick structure? Um, that is our trial works where we render whale oil. Um, no, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I absolutely, absolutely love whales more than anything in the world. Um, but um, no, it's actually a grill. Um, so now the only thing we render there are burgers or veggie burgers. Right. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's what it was built for. It just looks cool, you know, the whaler and to have a triworks. But yeah, it's actually just a grill. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the question is, did I have a crew when I sailed my first delivery? Yes, I was actually, um, I was only 19. Um, so I was just the lowest man on the totem pole. Um, I was very fortunate um, to sail. The captain on board that was an incredible sailor um, from uh, France who um, he taught me so much and he was very, very patient with me and uh, for that whole delivery. So there were actually four of us on board and we picked up an extra crew member. Um, uh, we had to switch out some crew members in Bermuda. And how I ended up on that trip was a neighbor of mine um, from where I had my boat. And he ended up, he was a really phenomenal sailor too who came in and I, I've been really fortunate throughout my career to have some really amazing mentors and people who have just been very patient and taught me. So, yeah. <laughs> so the question is, when we were bringing the ship to the tanker, what actually holds it next to the tanker? Um, so yes, so um, how we brought it over was we actually had to, we used, um, we brought it over and we came alongside and then they dropped down really long mooring lines. And so she was moving just, a, she was pretty much secure, but it's not the most secure. That's when they lowered down the, um, the straps for the crane and then they got those underneath. Um, but it was just like these insanely long mooring lines that came down from the deck of the tanker. On the, tank, on the deck of the tanker. Oh, yes. Uh, yes, yeah, so similar to being blocked in a uh, shipyard, um, they block the boat on the deck of the tanker. And then what they'll do is uh, they basically strap it down um, with huge, huge straps to just hold it tight right down to the deck. Was she the only boat on there? Uh, the question is, was she the only boat? No, she wasn't the only boat. Um, there were actually quite a lot of ships on that transport. So, <laughs> let's hear it for Michael and Christine. Thank you. Okay. A couple of gifts for you. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank, you. Uh, thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. So when we first uh, piloted the Girls Motion Science program last year, we used the double dolphin, and Christine was the captain of that. It was an all-female crew. Uh, that was, so we've been working with Christine for a while, and she was wonderful last year when we did that. 
that have been great to work with this year. Uh, uh, a lot of you know that about a year and a half ago, the Maritime Museum was accredited by the American Alliance of Museums. Uh, yeah. Uh, like 33,000 museums across the United States, only 1,100 are accredited, so it was a big deal. But they uh, specifically recognized us for us, our project-based education programming, and this is the ideal example of that project-based learning. Uh, so it's been wonderful to work with uh, both Christine and Michael, and of course with Kristen's uh, continued support of our education program. So it's really nice to have Mystic Whaler here. Thank you all for being here. I hope you'll get on this show well <laughs> and we'll see you back again soon. Thank you.